Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru and today we are checking out NVIDIA's latest GPU, the RTX 3060. Announced last month as part of CES 2021, the RTX 3060 is the latest Ampere GPU to hit the market and it is also meant to be the cheapest with an MSRP of £299. But as I think we can all probably guess by now, I really don't expect pricing to be at that point at least not anytime soon. However, I don't really want to focus on that side of things at the minute, so let's get back to the GPU. As you probably know, there's no founds edition for the RTX 3060, so today we are checking out Gigabyte's Gaming OC model. I also think it's worth recapping some key specs of this GPU as it has been over a month since the initial announcement. First things first then, RTX 3060 is using a brand new GPU known as GA106. This houses 28 SMs and there's 128 CUDA calls per SM and that gives us a grand total of 3584. Alongside that we find 112 Tensor cores, 28 RT cores, 48 ROPs as well as 112 Texture units. A lot has also been made about the 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory, which is obviously more than both the 3060 Ti, the 3070 and even the 3080. The key thing to remember though is that it is using a narrower interface at 192 bits. This means with the memory clocked at 15 gigabits per second, we get total memory bandwidth at 360 gigabytes a second. So that's about 20% lower than the RTX 3060 Ti. As for clock speed, the reference boost clock is 1777 MHz, but as we have the gaming OC, this is a bit higher at 1837 MHz, while we also have a total graphics power rating of 170 watts, which is the same for both the gaming OC and the reference spec. Enough of that though, I really do want to dive into the testing as soon as possible. As always, for all of our benchmarks, we used our regular GPU test system, which was provided to us by PC Specialist. This consists of an i9-10900K running at 5.1 GHz across all cores. We've paired that with the Asus ROG Maximus 12 Hero motherboard, and there's also 32GB of Corsair Vengeance DDR4 memory clocked at 3600 MHz. For this review, we're presenting completely fresh data for all of our comparison GPUs, which I've spent the last week or so testing, and that was done with latest drivers. So for AMD, that was with the Adrenaline 20.2.2 driver, and for Nvidia, that was with the 461.40 driver. For all of our testing today for the 3060, Nvidia provided press with the 461.64 driver. The very final thing I want to say before we get to the benchmarks is that in this video I'm going to be focusing on 1080p and 1440p performance. I did however test 4K, so if you want to see that data as well as all of our benchmarks, you want to read those in your own time, be sure to check out the written article over on kitguru.net. Let's kick off the game testing though and we will start with Assassin's Creed Valhalla. At 1080p the RTX 3060 averaged 65 FPS, sitting right between the 2060 Super and the RX 5700. We can also see it is 16% faster than the RTX 2060, but 16% slower than the RX 5700 XT. Up at 1440p, the RTX 3060 is now dead even with the RX 5700 as both hit 52 FPS on average. The higher resolution also sees the RTX 3060 scale better compared to its predecessor as it is now 21% faster than the RTX 2060. Moving on to Control now, this Nvidia sponsored title sees the RTX 3060 beating out both the RX 5700 and 5700 XT when testing at 1080p as we can see an average of 88 FPS. That's a 22% uplift compared to both the RTX 2060 and the RX 5700. As for 1440p, it's still very playable actually with an average of 56 FPS and that's 10% faster than AMD's RX 5700 XT. The gains compared to the RTX 2060 do also increase as the pixel count goes up with the RTX 3060 now 27% faster. Moving on, as one of the most demanding games in our suite, it's a great indicator of overall performance to see the RTX 3060 
averaging 65 FPS in Cyberpunk 2077. This puts it 3% ahead of the RX 5700 XT and it's 21% faster than the RTX 2060. Stepping up to 1440p will reduce average frame rates down to 40 FPS, so that's still 5% faster than the RX 5700 XT. We can also see the 3060 beating both the 5700 as well as the RTX 2060 by a 21% margin. Dirt 5 is the next game up and at 1080p we're looking at a 22% uplift for the RTX 3060 when compared to its predecessor. We can also see it's 5% faster than the RX 5700 in this AMD sponsored title but it is also 6% slower than the 5700 XT. One thing we can note though is that the RTX 3060 actually scales better against those AMD GPUs as we step up to the 1440p resolution. There it is 10% faster than the RX 5700 and now just 4% behind the 5700 XT. Versus the RTX 2060 we're still looking at a 22% difference in the 3060's favour. Moving on now to the Division 2. Frame rates are generally higher in this game than most of the other games we test and we can see an average of 108 FPS at 1080p. This puts the RTX 3060 neck and neck with the RX 5700 XT while it's also a 10% improvement over the 2060 Super. Compared to the vanilla 2060 we're talking another 21% FPS increase. The 3060 plays very smoothly at 1440p2 as we see an average frame rate of 71 FPS. That makes the 3060 18% faster than the RX 5700 and it's also 27% faster than the RTX 2060 and that's one of the biggest margins we will see between those two GPUs. Frame rates get even higher in F1 2020 with the RTX 3060 almost managing 140 FPS at 1080p. This puts it above both the RTX 2060 Super and RX 5700 but it is 9% slower than the 5700 XT. As you'd expect from this game performance is still excellent at 1440p with the average frame rate holding above 100 FPS. Scaling against the 5700 and 5700 XT hasn't changed either but the 3060 is now 22% faster than the 2060. Gears 5 now is a lot tougher on the GPU than F1 2020 and at 1080p we see 85 FPS on average for the RTX 3060. Despite this being an AMD sponsored title, this makes the 3060 10% faster than the RX 5700 and it's only just behind the 5700 XT. Against the RTX 2060 we're looking at an extra 23% performance. Up at 1440p the RTX 3060 scales even better as it's now 2% faster than the RX 5700 XT and still 13% ahead of the RX 5700. Performance has also improved by 25% against the RTX 2060. Next we come to Hitman 3 and this is a pretty new game and despite not being sponsored by either AMD or Nvidia it's actually AMD GPUs which perform a lot better than expected in this title. The RTX 3060 for instance is actually 4% slower than the RX 5700 here and it's only fractionally ahead of the 5600 XT at 1080p. Up at 1440p frame rates are still very high with the 3060 averaging 91 FPS but the AMD GPUs once more have the upper hand. There's basically no difference between the 3060 and the 5600 XT while the 3060 is itself 16% slower than the RX 5700 XT. As for Metro Exodus, this title turns the tide back towards the RTX 3060, as at 1080p it is level with the 5700 XT, but 12% faster than the 5700. Gen on gen, we're looking at another 21% boost versus the RTX 2060. That GPU scaling is also pretty consistent when we step up to 1440p, as the 3060 is still fractionally ahead of the 5700 XT and we can also see it come in 8% faster than the RTX 2060 Super. Next we come to Red Dead Redemption 2 and this is another game where we see strong performance from the RTX 3060. Averaging exactly 60 FPS at 1080p 
the 3060 is 20% faster than the RX 5700 here, and that is pretty impressive. We can also see it's 3% ahead of the 5700 XT and 22% faster than the RTX 2060. Up at 1440p, I'd say that Red Dead 2 is still very playable with the 3060, averaging just under 50 FPS. That makes it still 20% faster than the RX 5700, and it's also 4% ahead of the RX 5700 XT. Second to last on our games list now, we come to Total War Saga Troy. This DX11 title sees the RTX 3060 once more ahead of the RX 5700 by a decent margin, which is 13% at 1080p. We can also see this new Ampere GPU is basically on par with the 5700 XT. Compared to the RTX 2060, however, the scaling isn't as impressive here as the Ampere GPU is just 16% faster than its predecessor. Thankfully, that does improve as we step up to 1440p, as the RTX 3060 is now 19% faster than the RTX 2060, as it averages 56 FPS. It is still just about faster than the 5700 XT as well. Our final game of the day then is Watch Dogs Legion. The results here are fascinating, as at 1080p, the 3060 gets absolutely pumped by the 5700 XT as it comes in 15% slower. It's also just behind the RX 5700, and do remember, this is actually an NVIDIA-sponsored title. At 1440p, the RTX 3060 does catch up somewhat, but it's still 9% slower than the 5700 XT. Versus the RTX 2060, however, we're looking at a 32% gen-on-gen improvement, which is the biggest difference between the two GPUs across all of our games at 1440p. So that is it for our individual game benchmarks, but here we're going to take a look at the big picture overview with our average frame rate chart. Looking first at the 1080p average performance, the RTX 3060 sits pretty neatly between the 5700 and the 5700 XT. It's 5% slower than the 5700 XT, but also 8% faster than the 5700. We can also see that compared to the 2060 Super, it is on average 7% faster, and we see a 21% difference between the RTX 3060 and the RTX 2060. As for 1440p, the RTX 3060 is definitely viable at this resolution, provided you don't mind dropping below 60 FPS in certain titles. Here we can see the 3060 is on average 3% slower than the RX 5700 XT and 10% faster than the RX 5700. It also extends its lead over the RTX 2060 to 25%. Next up we do also have cost per frame data using the launch MSRPs. I am going to show this but really only for academic purposes as I want to put a big disclaimer obviously GPUs at MSRP is just not a thing at the minute, so we're only really looking at this more for interest sake to see if in a normal world what the cost per frame would be. So do bear that in mind as we look at these figures. So if you could find GPUs at MSRP and the RTX 3060 cost £299, it would offer a 25% reduction in cost per frame compared to the RTX 2060, which certainly isn't bad. It's not quite as competitive as the 3060 Ti, but it's not far off. However, Gigabyte did actually tell us that the MSRP for the Gaming OC model is going to be £429, which is obviously very high, but to be fair to Gigabyte, I think they're just being realistic in the current climate. If we factor in that pricing, cost per frame is clearly far less competitive, and it's actually worse than the RTX 2060. Like I said though, I wouldn't put too much stock into cost per frame these days just because of all the pricing being very volatile as a result of almost no availability. The next area to look at is the very small matter of ray tracing. With 28 RT cores for the RTX 3060, here we're going to go back and look at Control, Metro Exodus and Watch Dogs Legion to see what sort of ray tracing experience you get with the RTX 3060. Starting with control at 1080p then, the performance here with the ray traced effects set to high is certainly respectable, averaging 54 FPS at 1080p. 
That's a 39% reduction in FPS compared to playing without ray tracing though, but there is of course the option to enable DLSS 2.0 and regain that lost performance. We can also see the 3060 is actually just behind the RTX 2070 Super, which managed 55 FPS with ray tracing enabled. Next up is Metro Exodus, which uses ray trace global illumination. Overall, this isn't as demanding as we see a 31% hit to performance when enabling ray tracing in this title. That means the RTX 3060 averaged 90 FPS with RT set to ultra. That really isn't bad and actually puts it on par with the RTX 2070 Super, which is the faster GPU when ray tracing is disabled. Finally, we come to Watch Dogs Legion, which uses ray trace reflections. At 1080p, enabling ray tracing sees a 36% reduction to frame rate, dropping the average FPS down to 41. That's still decent scaling against the 2070 Super though, as the 3060 is just 7% slower with ray tracing enabled, compared to being 14% slower with ray tracing disabled. Something else new for the RTX 3060 that we definitely need to talk about is Nvidia's support for resizable bar. We first saw this as part of AMD's Smart Access Memory when that launched with the RX 6000 series, but with the RTX 3060 this is the first Nvidia GPU to get support for the technology. Unlike Smart Access Memory or SAM, this will work with either AMD or Intel platforms, you just need your motherboard to have support for resizable bar. For me, testing with the ASUS ROG Maximus 12 Hero, I just needed to enable this within the PCI subsystem settings, although you can also verify whether resizable bar is enabled within the NVIDIA control panel. Compared to Smart Access Memory, there is one key difference in how NVIDIA is implementing the technology. In a nutshell, resizable bar won't actually work in any games unless Nvidia has verified that the game will actually give you a performance boost. The reasoning here was that with AMD, you could actually lose performance when enabling SAM in certain games. So unless a game is on Nvidia's allow list, it won't actually do anything. As of right now, there's only 8 DX12 games on the allow list, and these are as follows. Battlefield 5, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Gears 5, Borderlands 3, Red Dead Redemption 2, Metro Exodus, Watch Dogs Legion, and Forza Horizon 4. In theory, what this should mean is, if a game isn't one of those 8 games currently on the allow list, and Nvidia has said it is going to continually work to update that list as it verifies the performance of more and more games, but if a game isn't on that allow list, it should behave as if resizable bar was simply not enabled. Funnily enough, I actually tested all 12 games at 1080p before I knew about that list, and actually doing so has pretty much confirmed what Nvidia has said. I tested 4 games that were on the list, but of the other 8 there was absolutely no change in performance. Initially I was just thinking resizable bar really wasn't doing anything, but considering that a game has to be on the allow list, it does make sense. Of those four games that I did test, we did see a small difference in a few of them. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, for instance, saw a 2% boost to performance. Gears 5 saw a 4% boost to performance. There was another 2% in Metro Exodus. And our biggest increase came from Watch Dogs Legion, which saw a 5% boost to performance. It's clearly not something to go crazy about. And yes, the list of games currently supported is pretty small. However, if you do want to play one of those games and you have a 3060, enabling SAM shouldn't hurt your performance as we have shown here. It shouldn't hurt your performance in games that don't support it and we can't really complain about 2-5%. to It's really not very exciting, but it is certainly nothing to complain about. Leaving gaming performance behind us now, it's time to move on. We'll look at things like power draw as well as thermals. As mentioned, no Founders Edition, so we're taking a look at Gigabyte's Gaming OC. In terms of design, this looks functionally identical to the RTX 3070 Gaming OC that we reviewed a couple of months ago. It has three 18mm fans where the central one spins in reverse, and we can also see a pretty stylish silver backplate with a fairly large cutout towards the end of the card to allow the airflow to pass directly through the heatsink. It is also pretty big for a 170 watt GPU, measuring in at 282 
by 117 by 41 millimeters. We can also see that power requirements are a single 8 pin power connector with Nvidia officially recommending a 550 watt PSU. Starting off with our thermal testing then, as this is our first RTX 3060 card, we don't have much context as to how good the gaming OC's cooler is going to be relative to the competition. That being said, hitting a peak of just 61 degrees for the GPU is clearly an objectively excellent result. I think it'll be fascinating to see how other smaller cards can handle this Geo 106 GPU though, and I know we are going to be taking a look at one of those in the Palette Storm X OC, so stay tuned for that review. Next up, we can also see that noise levels are absolutely fine from the gaming OC. It isn't the absolute quietest card we've ever tested. Sapphire's RX 5600 XT Pulse does come in 3 dBA quieter, but even then, producing as much noise as an NVIDIA Founds Edition really isn't bad. For reference, during our testing, the gaming OC's fans spun up to 67% or 1730 RPM. Given those fans only produce 37 decibels of noise, there is clearly scope to reduce temperatures when noise normalizing to 40 decibels. Here we include the traditional GPU temperature as well as the new hotspot temperature which GPU-Z and HW Info can access. For the gaming OC then we had to increase fan speed to 77% or 2220 RPM and that reduced temperatures for both the edge and the hotspot by 5 degrees. Another key part of our testing is going to be graphics card only power draw. For the RTX 3060 Gaming OC, we measured an average power consumption of 174 watts, and that's in line with the official rating of 170 watts. This means power consumption is barely higher than the RTX 2060 Super, and it's actually dead level with the RX 5700. Using that power data, we can also assess performance per watt. Overall efficiency of the RTX 3060 is certainly good, but it isn't quite as good as the 3060 Ti. In fact, at 1080p, it's level with the RX 5600 XT, which launched about this time last year. Compared to the RTX 2060, we're looking at a performance per watt increase of 10%. Up at 1440p now, the RTX 3060 does do a bit better here, but it's still behind the RTX 3060 Ti, by 14%. Thankfully though, compared to the RTX 2060, we're now looking at a performance per watt improvement of 15%. The final area I'm going to look at here is going to be manual overclocking. Thankfully, we did have some good success with this card. Firstly, we maximized the power limit slider up to 124%, and we also maxed out the temperature slider. For our GPU clock, our best result came with an offset of plus 160 MHz, and for the memory, we managed an extra 500 megahertz. I did find that the GPU was stable with a memory overclock of up to 800 megahertz, but just be sure you're actually getting a performance increase, as I noticed anything above 500 megahertz resulted in performance degradation. In the real world, this overclock saw our clock speed increase from 1922 megahertz up to 2090 megahertz. The GPU would actually frequently bounce above 2100 megahertz, which is always good to see. As for the actual gaming performance, this extra frequency netted us 7% boost in F1 2020, an 8% gain in Gears 5, and then another 6% boost in Watch Dogs Legion. Like other Ampere GPUs, we're not talking massive gains, but it is decent, especially considering the fact that power draw only rose by 14 watts, and that's an 8% increase over stock. So then, that is going to do it for our testing today, and overall, the RTX 3060 is definitely a solid GPU. You can probably tell I'm not as enthused about it as I was for the 3060 Ti, for instance, but it is setting a new standard for a £300 GPU. That is, if we ignore for the moment the fact that you simply won't be able to buy any of these cards at that price, but that's currently just a fact of life. Back to the 3060 though, the main reason I'm not that enthused about it is simply because it's not really delivering as big of a gen on gen increase as the other Ampere GPUs we have seen. At 1080p for instance, which I do actually think is the 3060's best resolution, we can see it is on average 21% faster than the RTX 2060. Up at 1440p, 
it is on average 25% faster. Contrast that with the 3060 Ti, which is 40% faster than the 2060 Super, and you can probably see why I'm just not that enthused. Don't get me wrong, it's certainly not a bad GPU. It still managed to hit on average 60 FPS in every game we tested at 1080p. And bear in mind that is using ultra settings. The main thing for me is just right now there is no competitor to this card. We're just waiting for AMD's RGNA2 products to hit the mid range. Even then, actually comparing the 3060 to the RX 5700, it's only faster by 8% on average when testing at 1080p. Of course, we will have to wait until we can test it ourselves, but I'm looking at those numbers and thinking the RX 6700 won't actually need to be that much faster than its predecessor to outperform the 3060. For now then, that really does kind of leave us in a waiting game. Like I said, the 3060 is fine. It's not a bad card. It just hasn't excited me as much as something like the 3060 Ti or even the 3070. If I were AMD though, I would definitely be looking at this GPU. I'd be sitting there thinking, you know what? This card is there for the taking. So hopefully, if the rumors are true and the 6700 does indeed launch next month, we could be in for an exciting time. That has been it for this review though, guys. So if you liked it, toss me a thumbs up, leave me a comment down below, and let me know your thoughts on the new RTX 3060. You can also subscribe if you haven't already, ding that notification bell as we've got another couple of AIB cards to review, and why not join our Discord server, which is linked in the description. While you're there, you can also check out some of our merch, and it'd also be awesome if one of you guys would consider backing us on Patreon, where you can see some of our content early and get access to exclusive giveaways. Until then though guys, I'm Dominic4KitGuru, and I'll see you in the next video.